Diane Wilson, Mechaton descendant, is an award-winning author and gardener. Her essays and memoirs use personal experiences to illustrate broader social and historical contexts. Ms. Wilson's first book, Spirit Car, Journey to a Dakota Past, won the 2006 Minnesota Award for Memoir, Autobiography, and Creative Nonfiction. Her second book, Beloved Child, Dakota Way of Life, released in 2011, is a collection of personal stories and has received awards from Jerome Travel and Study Program, the Minnesota State Arts Board, Ragdale Artist Residency, and the Hedgebrook Residency for Women Writers. Ms. Wilson is the director, is the executive director of Dream of Wild Health, a native-owned 10-acre farm in Fargo, Minnesota. Her mission is to promote health in the native community by expanding knowledge of and access to healthy indigenous foods and medicines. During her keynote, Ms. Ms. Wilson will be joined by youth leaders, Marcia, Marisha Hoff, and Dwayne Williams, who will speak about how Dream of Wild Health has impacted them. Ms. Wilson is also a master gardener and maintains a large butterfly garden filled with native plants. She is a member of the Dakota Kisiya and helps organize the Dakota commemorative marches on the Lower Sioux Reservation. Let us welcome Ms. Diane uh, Wilson. Hello, my relatives. It's good to see you here today. So I'm going to share a few thoughts with you, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to introduce two of the young men from our program to, to share their thoughts with you. But first of all, I really want to express my appreciation to the organizers of the conference and to Metro State for the invitation to be here today. This is truly an honor uh, to be part of this conference. Um, so when, when the, I was first asked to um, add my perspective on truth-telling, I really had to think about what I could bring to a conversation about overcoming racism. And so today, I'm here to talk to you about the two aspects of truth-telling that have shaped my own life and work as a writer and as the director for Dream of Wild Health Farm. Years ago, when I was trying to figure out how to reconnect with my Dakota identity, I was watching a documentary on Dakota history as they were interviewing historian David Larson from Lower Sioux. He said, if you know what was taken away, then you can reclaim it. In those few words, he summed up the essence of truth-telling as it relates to cultural recovery. First, we have to learn our true history to know what was taken away. And second, knowing that history will help us return to the stories and teachings that nourish and sustain our communities. David Larson's few words became the core focus of my writing work. At the time, I was researching my family's history in an effort to understand how our cultural identity had changed over time. While I grew up in a suburb of Minneapolis, my mother was enrolled at the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. She spent six years at the Holy Rosary Mission School, a boarding school for Native children on the Pine Ridge Reservation. When I tried to ask her questions, she would only say, we were poor, I'm done with all that. Her silence 
was a closed door on the past. On one of my research trips to Rapid City, I visited the Journey Museum to see its exhibit on native and settler history. I stopped in front of a wall of photographs about boarding schools that was titled Breakdown of Teoshbaye. The companion essay explained how the extended family system, or Teoshbaye, was intrinsic to Dakota culture before European contact. Simply put, a Dakota person was raised to be a good relative by his or her parents, training that began when an infant was placed in a cradleboard and continuing through the five stages of life. By separating children from their families, the boarding school system was instrumental in breaking down the Teoshbaye and therefore the Dakota culture. As I looked through the wall of photographs that accompanied this essay, I suddenly recognized a picture of my mother standing in a long line of young women at Holy Rosary, smiling her beautiful smile for the camera. The shock of seeing her face in this exhibit on the breakdown of Teoshbaye forced me to see the connection between my mother's silence and the government's systematic and brutal campaign to assimilate Native people by targeting their children. I followed our family's story all the way back to the 1862 Dakota War. My Dakota great-great-grandmother, Rosalie Ironcloud, was living across the river from the Lower Sioux Agency when the war broke out. Her family was caught in the middle of a conflict that was catastrophic for both the Dakota and white settlers. Yet very little has been taught about this history in our schools, and nothing at all about the forced removal of the Dakota after the war. So I began asking, why wasn't this history being taught in Minnesota? Who benefits from the silence? In 2002, I saw a flyer for the first ever Dakota commemorative march and knew immediately that I had to be part of it. The march was organized by Gabby Tateyushkanshkan, Wazia Tawin, and Leo Omani, all Dakota scholars and historians. Their intention was to honor and remember the 1,700 men, women, or excuse me, 1,700 women, children, and elders who were force marched 150 miles to Fort Snelling after the war. On that first morning, when a small group of us gathered outside the community center on the Lower Sioux Reservation, Chris Matonumpa explained to us that colonization meant that not only had Europeans stolen ancestral lands and sought to dismantle Dakota culture, but the Dakota themselves had absorbed these attitudes over time. <clears throat> As he spoke, I finally understood that my family's story was part of a much larger history, that missionaries, boarding schools, land allotment, intermarriage, and blood quantum were all coercive tools in assimilating Native families like mine. The silence that surrounded the war was nothing more than a mask to cover up the government's efforts to acquire Dakota land at any cost. I also understood that once this history is known, then the act of closing one's eyes to it is a form of collusion with the colonizer. In reclaiming my family's story, I now had a responsibility as a witness to injustice, as well as responsibility for my part of our family legacy. As Severt Jungber explained in his book, Standing in the Light, a Lakota Way of Seeing, a family's history, its name, its unique identity only survive as long as there is someone to remember them. Each of us carries the responsibility not only to maintain our family history, 
but also to shape it for future generations. Out of that long process emerged my first book, a memoir titled Spirit Car, Journey to a Dakota Past, which uses my family's story to show how assimilation has worked in this country. I wrote it not as a history, but as a true story about real people. My intention was to go beyond the academic terms that so often frame a conversation about racism. I wanted the reader to see, hear, and feel what this experience meant to a family in a way that might help build empathy and understanding around this difficult history. To me, these individual stories are the foundation of truth-telling, whether they're shared around a kitchen table, in a book, or at a conference. Too many generations have been silenced from fear, from a need to survive, from shame, or simply because they carried too much pain and could not speak of it. We share these stories for our ancestors who suffered so that we could survive and for the generations yet to come. Linda Hogan writes, it is story really that finds its way into language and story is at the very crux of healing, at the heart of every ceremony and ritual in the older America. Through our stories, we challenge our national amnesia, the willful denial of a painful history that has been shaped by the deliberate choices and policies of the past, both by individuals and by our government. When we tell the truth about what has happened to us, to our families, then we shine a light into the dark shadows of the past. We no longer carry a textbook history that was written to reinforce the power and class structure that has dominated this country since 1492 and denies the reality of millions of people who has suffered through the racism that is endemic to the earliest days of our government. <clears throat> Excuse me. After Spirit Car was published, I began digging deeper into the experience of Dakota people. Following the removal from Minnesota Makoche after the 1862 war, an estimated 600 children died from mal malnutrition and disease in those first years at the Crow Creek Reservation. In 1883, any practice of Native spirituality was outlawed, denying Native people their ability to find comfort and healing from their losses. Four years later, in 1887, the first federal boarding school was established in Carlisle, Pennsylvania by Captain Richard Pratt, who said, kill the Indian and save the man. The government determined that it was less expensive to assimilate children through these schools than to continue trying to exterminate Native people through warfare. Nearly 500 schools were established across the United States, with churches running 460 government-funded boarding and day schools. As historian David Wallace Adams wrote in his book, Education for Extinction, for tribal elders who had witnessed the catastrophic developments of the 19th century, the bloody warfare, the near extinction of the bison, the scourge of disease and starvation, the shrinking of the tribal base, the indignities of reservation life, the invasion of missionaries and white settlers, there seemed to be no end to the cruelties perpetrated by whites. And after all this, the schools. After all this, the white man had concluded that the only way to save Indians was to destroy them, that the last great Indian war should be waged against children. They were coming for the children. When the children arrived at the schools, many after being abducted from their homes, their hair was cut, their traditional clothing was replaced with uniforms, 
and they were forced to worship as Christians. Native languages were forbidden. Over the next several decades, more than 100,000 Native children were forced to attend these schools. Among these children were my grandparents, my great aunt who attended Carlisle, four of my aunts, and my mother. And yet, no one in my family knew anything about why boarding schools were established. Again, we have to ask the question, why aren't we taught about this history? Who benefits from the silence? By the 1950s and 60s, social service agencies began removing Native children from their families at a rate five times greater than any other community, including here in Minnesota. These children were most often placed in non-Native families. Finally, in 1978, the government passed the Indian Child Welfare Act to protect the rights of Native children and families. That same year, the right of Native people to practice their own spirituality was restored nearly a hundred years after it was outlawed. Both of these changes are recent within my lifetime and within the lifetime of many people in this room. Today, when I read the statistics that Native youth have the highest rate of suicide in the country, that they are graduating from Minneapolis public schools at a rate near 20%. What I see is the unresolved heartbreak of generations of Native people who have suffered the loss of their children, their land, their spirituality, and their health. When we look beyond these statistics to the stories of grief and loss, then we see these numbers for what they truly are the result of human rights violations intended to exterminate Native people, both culturally and physically, that remain unacknowledged by churches, states, and the federal government. A Lakota scholar, Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart, defined the term historical trauma to explain how the effects of traumatic events like boarding schools and removals are passed between generations. Sometimes described as a soul wound in Native people, this trauma is part of the invisible legacy that we inherit. Dr. Braveheart also founded the Takini Network, whose Lakota name means to come back to life. Through her network, she has defined a process for helping people heal from historical trauma. The first step, is to embrace the history. In other words, we tell our stories. We break down the silence that has been used to bury the past. When we understand the history, then we can see how it manifests in symptoms such as depression and substance abuse. We can begin to release the grief through ceremonies and participating in events like the Dakota Commemorative March. And finally, we find ways to transcend the trauma so that we no longer live our lives as victims. The question of how we can transform this trauma became the focus for my second book, Beloved Child, A Dakota Way of Life. As I was struggling to understand how we move beyond despair and rage at what has been done not only to Native people, but to communities of color across the country. I had a conversation with Glenn Washichuna, a Dakota elder and first language speaker. He shared a powerful dream with me and explained how we all have to pass through concentric rings of healing to get to the center, which he described as the common heart of man. As I asked questions about how this works, he said to me, heal yourself first. I had no idea what that meant. But as a writer, I decided that I could learn by interviewing Dakota elders whose lives exemplified a process of transforming harm 
into helping their communities create a better way of life for our children. What I wanted to know from them was how do we do this work on a daily basis? How do we get up in the morning and live in a way that begins to make change? I spoke first with Harley and Sue Eagle, a family I had met at the 2006 Dakota Commemorative March. Harley and I agreed that the most difficult loss the Dakota had experienced was not being able to keep their children safe. Harley told me about the child beloved ceremony that Ella Deloria described in her novel, Water Lily. In that ceremony, a child whose life had been threatened by illness or near death was given a special outfit that included moccasins that were beaded on the soles. This ceremony symbolized how the child would be carried and cherished throughout his or her life, a beautiful expression of the great love that the Dakota have always had for their children. To get back to raising beloved children, Harley said, would require making change that means returning to living as an authentic human being. It's about restoring a relationship that's based on love and respect. We need to be true to ourselves. We need to act according to the core values that are intrinsic to indigenous culture. When I interviewed Clifford Chongku, a Dakota, a Dakota elder and spiritual leader from Sisituang, he told me to remind people that the past 500 years is a short time in the history of Native people in this country. The Dakota have been present in Minnesota, Makoche for thousands of years, and it is our spirituality that has allowed us to survive. Tell them, he said, that's who Dakota people are, not the statistics you read in the paper. We are people who raise beloved children, who treat the earth as our mother, and regard being a good relative to be of utmost importance to the community. Tell them that our ancestors suffered so that we could be happy. When we only hear the stories that share the trauma of the past, then it's easy to overlook the gifts that were also part <clears throat> of this history. In the time before Columbus, indigenous tribes of the Americas developed three-fifths of the world's crops that are now in production, including maize or corn. Over centuries of close relationship with the plant nation, Native people accumulated a vast knowledge of plant properties that became the basis for modern pharmacology. Indigenous peoples held detailed traditional knowledge about how to live in balance with the natural laws of a particular place. Tewa educator Greg Kayeti called this sacred science a way of knowing, remembering, practicing, and implementing place-based natural laws, which consist of eminently practical knowledge for survival. Indigenous people also created early maps that combined both the terrestrial and cosmological worlds, equitable social systems, government, architecture, philosophy, and an aesthetic that incorporated beauty within all aspects of daily life. So how was it that such sophisticated and accomplished peoples could be overrun by the arrival of the Europeans? As Jack Weatherford stated in his book, Indian Givers, while American Indians had spent millennia becoming the world's greatest farmers and pharmacists, the people of the old world had spent a similar period amassing the world's greatest arsenal of weapons. Once I understood that the past 500 years is a rift in our connection to this rich cultural legacy 
then the question became one of understanding how do we begin to reclaim it? I went back to talk again with Glenn Washichuna. This time he explained to me that we do this healing work by returning to the traditional values that every tribe carries. In this way, we become the people that our ancestors were. We honor the sacrifices they made and the suffering they experienced. When we share stories that nourish us, stories that help us relearn and recover what was taken away, when we relearn our languages and our traditions, when we raise healthy children, then we are truth-telling in the way we live our lives. Through the blood memory that responds to the beat of a powwow drum, our body's truth-telling is the rhythm of the heart calling us home. When we find ways to transcend the trauma of the past, as well as that of the present, then we become free to be joyful in our lives. We are free to pursue justice, to work to change the systems and institutions that continue to oppress and discriminate against communities of color. We accept responsibility for our own role in changing this history for the generations yet to come. Listening to my mother's story all those many years ago, making the connections between her truth and the experience of Native people across the country, and taking responsibility for that family legacy in my own life brought me to the work that I do today. In my role as the director for Dream of Wild Health, a nonprofit farm that helps Native people reconnect with traditional foods and medicines, I have found work that nourishes my life and allows me to use my gifts to give back to the Native community. I first heard about Dream of Wild Health when it was a small garden in Farmington that was growing out rare indigenous seeds that were hundreds of years old. Again, just as it was with the Dakota Commemorative March, something in my heart immediately responded. As a gardener, I knew that these seeds were a fragile living record of the past, a tangible inheritance from our ancestors who knew that future generations, our generation, would need them for food. Each seed contains within its thin shell the entire circle of time itself, an endless cycle of creation. Our ancestors protected these seeds at all cost, knowing that they, like our children, are the future. <clears throat> Until I came to Dream of Wild Health, I had no idea that our relationship to food and the land was at the core of every culture. Nor did I understand that if you control the food, then you also control the people. Through my work, I've seen how the worldview that rationalized the genocide of Native people is now threatening the health and well-being of the earth, our food, and ultimately of every person in this room. Let me tell you a story. 200 years ago, much of the southern half of Minnesota Makoche was covered with millions of acres of incredibly rich, diverse prairie. This ecosystem supported a vast variety of plants, birds, insects, and animals. This is the homeland for the Dakota, who were skilled agriculturalists, nomadic hunters, and wild food gatherers. They grew corn that ripened early, hunted bison, deer, fish, and small game. They gathered many wild foods, including maple syrup, wild rice, berries, and nuts. Throughout the year, they moved around the region following the seasonal availability of their food. As white settlers moved into the state, millions of acres of prairie were plowed under to make room for a new way of growing food. 
the clash between cultures that began in 1492 was as much about our drastically different food systems as it was about our differing values, languages, and spirituality. When the Dakota were forced to surrender this land in the 1850s and were subsequently removed from the state following the 1862 Dakota War, they were in essence surrendering their tradi traditional foods as well. In place of seasonal, nutritionally dense whole foods, they were moved onto reservations and given commodity foods that were high in starch and fat, a story that was repeated with tribes across the nation. As a result, today Native people are experiencing epidemic levels of diabetes and obesity. Our modern day agriculture system represents a profound cultural shift towards treating the earth and the foods she provides as commodities. If the land is a commodity, she can be sold. If our plants and animals are commodities, they can be grown in factories under conditions that emphasize profit rather than relationship. If our ultimate goal is to make money at all costs, then we can rationalize an agriculture system that was built on the back of slaves and migrant workers that embedded racism within the heart of our food system. How our communities eat and how our food is grown is intimately connected to the environmental issues we face. The food choices we make create the world we live in. When the prairie was plowed under, that diversity was replaced with a system that depends on limited crops or monocultures, chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and genetically modified seeds. 150 years ago, the United States did not have a commercial seed industry. Today, companies like Monsanto control what has become the world's largest commercial seed industry, promoting a form of genetic manifest destiny throughout the world as they target small farmers in developing countries. Here in the United States, Monsanto's genetically modified seeds provide 90% of all corn, soybeans, canola, and sugar beets. At the same time, a sixth of the world's population is now hungry, while diet-related diseases in this country are reaching epidemic levels that disproportionately affect low-income communities of color. If we are to work towards racial justice, then we need to see how the issues around food are symptoms of a corporate system that is exploiting our land and water for profit. Choctaw historian Devin Mehezua has written, the recovery of the people is tied to the recovery of food, since food itself is medicine, not only for the body, but for the soul and for the spiritual connection to history, ancestors, and the land. We begin this work by truth-telling, sharing both the stories of the inequities in our systems, as well as the stories that nourish us. We begin by rebuilding an indigenous relationship with the earth. We have a saying in Dakota, mitakuye owasi, which means we are all related. At the Dream of Wild Health Farm in Hugo, we teach native youth from the cities about gardening, cooking, and culture. We begin each day in circle with prayer. We teach them that we are all related to each other, to the plants and medicines that grow in the fields, to the deer that leave trails through the long grass, to the warm soil that nourishes our seeds. From that understanding, we begin to teach the kids about reciprocity, how we receive gifts from the plants and offer tobacco with prayers of gratitude. 
We teach them how to care for our indigenous seeds, how to treat them as sacred, and to understand that our food is our medicine. Slowly, day by day, as they enjoy foods that are grown from the seeds of their ancestors, their bodies are becoming indigenous from the inside out. In our summer youth programs, we don't spend much time talking about the difficult history Native people have shared. We see it every day in the challenges our kids face. Because they are children, we offer a safe place where they can be surrounded with love. We invite them to listen to the quiet, to hear the sweet call of the warbler and the rush of the wind through tall cottonwood trees. At the farm, the plants are our teachers. Every day we share a beautiful meal prepared by the youth and served at picnic tables in the front yard. Together, we are relearning how to be good relatives. To me, the most profound truth-telling of all is remembering that we are all beloved children. As we share our stories of pain and loss and beauty and love, we are creating a new living history from the voices of every person in this room. And so I would like to conclude today with a poem written by Gabrielle Tateushkanshkan, which is titled Star Spirit. Beloved child, you were brought to earth by the Wichampi Oyate. Falling to earth, you were formed in the imagination of the people through origin narrative. Spirit was manifest in the flesh of the living. Hopes of the ancestors flow in your blood. Your, so your first breath, a soft, soothing song, singing the story of the lives that have come and gone before you, lives that paved the way for your coming. By a falling star, you were entrusted to me, a sacred gift from the Creator to care for and protect with my heart. Pidamaya. Um, I would next I would like to introduce two of the young men who are longtime participants in our programs at the farm. Uh, we have uh, several programs that serve native youth from the cities, one of which is Cora's Kids, which is for um, kids ages 8 to 12. Uh, we have Garden Warriors for um, teens ages 13 to 18, and then the, the teens that do well in that program are invited to become youth leaders um, that goes year round. So I invited two of the young men who have been with our program for many years and who have uh, really developed into exceptional young leaders within, um, within our groups and within their communities. So I would like to introduce both Dwayne Williams and Jalen Morrison, if you want to join me up here. So I, I asked them if they would just speak briefly about how racism has affected their lives and what has helped them uh, work through it, to overcome it. And so first to speak is Dwayne Williams, who is a senior at Harding High School. Um, he's a captain of his wrestling team, and um, he's been with the program for about six, six years. So I've known him since he was a little guy. Um, and then we'll also hear from Jalen Morrison, and he is a junior at um, Highland Park Senior High, interested in uh, computer science and also uh, wild foraging for plants. So they will both speak briefly uh, from their own lives. Hello. 
Um, so I'd like to start off with a quote from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their cre creator with certain unalienable rights that are among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All men are created equal. That statement will never, like, has never been true throughout the whole history of the United States. How, how could I be equal to a different, like a 17 year old from a suburb school, let's say Apple Valley or so, like Simley or somewhere in Stillwater when my neighborhoods are, when our neighborhoods are two completely different places and environments. Um, like how my neighborhood has more parking lots than it does playgrounds or more places to get fast food fast food than places to get groceries or good food. Um, how could I be equal to another kid who has both their parents in their lives and good connection with their families when me on the other hand, I have my mother and that's about it. How could I be equal to someone else who already has a lot of resources or a lot of help or I don't know. A good school, a good learning environment. How could I be equal to somebody like that? Um, I've experienced discrimination, racism, stereotypes every day of my life. Um, starting off with like Washington Redskins, Cleveland Cleveland Indians, or North Dakota Fighting Sioux, all those names. How is like how is that not derogatory and? like degrading to Native American people. There aren't sports teams called <clears throat> like Minnesota White Skins, Minnesota Dark Skins, Minnesota the Latinos or, you know. Um, I can't go to sub, <clears throat> can't go to suburb places without being looked at funny or mm, like being stared at for longer than normal because of my skin color or because of how I sound or how I look. Mm. Another example, my mom, her dad is Native American. And for as long as I can remember, my grandma's side of the family has wanted nothing to do with me, my parents, my siblings, my cousins, my whatever, because we're Native American. That's, I don't know, it's terrible to be, it's, that is in my own family. Another thing is my stepmom, she's Asian, and her parents also have disowned her or just like cut her out from the family because of who she's with. My, my dad, African-American male. Um, I can't walk into stores without being looked at like I'm stealing or something or I don't know, like corner stores with the people running them just staring at me like I'm up to no good or anything. Um, another form. Everybody should be familiar with the Trayvon Martin case, where young African American male just walking by, be look because he looks suspicious. A guy, this Zimmerman guy, just decided to follow him or try to like take matters into his own hands, and it resulted in the death. It resulted in a death of Trayvon Martin. Um, Ways that I've overcome this, I can come to this farm every year. Um, this Dream Wild Health, I can come out to this farm every day and relate with other teens my age and talk about whatever. I could feel safe out there. Everybody is equal out there. Nobody is greater than one another. And it's just, it's a great environment to be around. And uh, something else that helps me get through, like not being able to know all my family or whatever is, I use that as motivation that one day I'll be more successful than they will. That uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll prove everybody wrong that has anything bad to say about me because of my color or because I sound different, look different, might look funny to them or whatever. And that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you.
Racism is more than just black and white. The borders of racism are not merely set upon two colors, but a variety, such as a rainbow, that are people who find themselves unique with their, with their own culture, set of beliefs, characteristics, and personal lives who find themselves brought to the pres present from their own history, set forth by actions that ultimately led up to their own condition that they face as their standing point with their lives. Actions that have been placed toward specific people to put them down and degrade them as an individual is not justice, nor gives anyone reason to simply hate the other by their differences of their appearance or how they act. If they are different, we must find a way to understand one another and make peace and not to rely on racism to separate and degrade the other group but to unify and work together, because in the end, we all are human beings. I'm a Native American, and what Native Americans have faced in the past date back early to the colonization of America. We faced extinction or the American Holocaust as an entire people that has left us crippled and in a state of struggle that will still, still affect us today, which is known, which may be as known as historical trauma. Historical trauma is defined in social work refers to cumulative emotional and physiological wounding exceeding over an individual lifespan and across generations caused by significant group traumatic experience facing genocide which has been an estimated 13 million dead has affected us greatly being moved from our homeland and shipped like cattle to poor lands that are reservations and even having th that slowly stripped from us broken promises and faced with the tyranny of what Americans called their manifest destiny is an excuse to massacre an entire people and start wars to conquer land as their own. This history is the reason why people don't like to know about Native Americans because it's the land, it's the land that they, they call home that was once the Native Americans that was taken unjustly. In a report, there, were, there was a finding of handcuffs for children that were found at a boarding school, school for Native Americans, to assimilate them into white society. As a founder of one of these schools, Army Officer Richard Pat Pratt said his mission was to kill the Indian and save the man. How necessary does it, a society have to be to enslave children? In my school, it's greatly affected me emotionally to go on the topic of early America, where there were multiple accounts of how the natives were treated and how it's absolutely hurt me deep down. But I was glad to know that this was even this was being taught in class in my history of the Americas and how they covered how the natives, even in all of the Americas, were affected by colonization. I found that I actually felt the sadness of what my ancestors felt during the time, like a moment, like a moment we're on a steamboat being stripped, shipped somewhere on the Mississippi. I have no account where, where I got in this memory, but I found myself there in one woman who I didn't know yet, no, yet I cared so much for to have just jumped off the ship and drowned herself because it was sadness that was too, too great. I learned after years that there were accounts of natives being shipped on boat to places and how they drown themselves by jumping off. I've worked with this program called Dream World Health that I've been in since I was 12. That really means a lot to me and is really important to not only me but to all of us for a, for a dream of wild health. This goes against the agricultural field of its own colonization that face GMOs such as Monsanto and works with native communities and has been greatly improving the lives of many natives who participate and are part of the program. I first joined it because I just really wanted to. It really stood out to me because I was in school and I was actually really, really sick of eating packaged food and wanted something healthier. And when this woman named Donna came into my classroom and to talk, a lot, talk about the program, I don't know why, but I was greatly interested, like deep down, I knew I can actually make a, diff a, a change in my life.
I wanted to eat healthier and learn more about my culture as in the agricultural way, how natives did it. But there was also there was a $200 payment, which was like a lot to me when I was 12. And I could have gotten, gotten so much of that during the summer because we were actually kind of poor at the time, living in an apartment with cockroaches and uh, with no car. We had to take the city bus from Brooklyn Park to Lake Street every day in the morning, which we got up at like around five. I overcame racism within my own life with the help of my mother, who was, single, who was a single teen mom at age 15 and raised me with the help of my family getting her, she got her diploma and she went to college and she is now working as a nurse in the medical field, which really motivated me. I also overcame racism by simply not being racist to others. I did not like disrespecting others by their appearance and that and found that wrong to do. What had helped me overcome it was sympathy because when when you're on the other side is being degraded being degraded and disrespected, I didn't want to put others in that situation. I found out that I didn't want to be the bad guy and be a racist ne neither did I want to disrespect others in a way that was ster that stereotyped and pu pushed the whole people into a group upon my ignorance. When I moved to a multicultural school, I was a pl I was in a place where there were multiple races, and that helped me accept other people. And because I had multiple friends of different races. That helped me accept other people, and because I had made multiple friends of different races, who I talked to and hung around with lun at lunch, that made me like to socialize without being judgmental toward others based on race or appearance. I needed to be a leader, and being a racist wasn't a leader quality that I, to me that I wanted. I also represented my school and the things that I was in, such as being in Dream of Wild Health. I am motivated to do my best to overcome this historical trauma and breaking these chains that restrain my life and, and from happiness and potential. I found a super special girl in my life that I'd like to help break statistics with and stop the cycle of sadness that was caused by racism. We're so proud of these two young men. So we have time if people have questions um, about our program or about anything else, <clears throat> excuse me, that we've talked about today. We're, o we're open to answering whatever you'd like to ask. He can run faster than me. Uh -huh. Thank you. Dan, I'm aware that um, at least one of the boarding schools that you referred to, Carlisle's, yeah. still exists. I'm wondering um, if you can say anything about how these schools function today and whether they ought to be shut down. Well, I think it's a, a, most of the schools have been either shut down or taken back under the control of the tribes. So they, they don't, um, as, you know, and I can't speak to the, the entire 500, but the ones I'm familiar with um, have been, uh, are, well, like the one my mom was at is, has been renamed and is under the control of the, of the tribe now. So I, th I believe that's what has taken place at many of them. Hi, I'm Tim Jenkins. I work for the state, uh, Minnesota Department of Health. And I'm wondering what you all feel that the uh, state could do about the food system. What the state should do about the food system? What, what are, I mean, it's a big question, but just... <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a good time to ask it. Boy, 
You know, one of the questions we wrestle with daily is how, how do you encourage people to change, um, you know, to change the way they eat? And w one of the biggest things we've learned about is that so much of it is not, part of it is individual choice, but by far the larger issues tend to be systemic. So that, you know, if you're a person of color living in a lower income uh, neighborhood, as Duane pointed out, you're surrounded by a lot more parking lots and fast food environments. So I think t uh, the state of Minnesota has the capability to really make systemic change. So that's, that's what I would encourage. Hi, my name is Joy, um, and I just, I've never thought about the food um, aspect of mm -hmm. oppression, and I just mm -hmm. thought that was really powerful, because, um, I mean, I have thought about it in other areas, but not in, um, th related to American Indian life, and I'm really, like, my husband and I eat all organically, we don't drink water with fluoride in it, we're really passionate about that, and I just think it's crazy that, like, GMOs are not labeled, so yeah. it's in all of our yes. food, and you don't even know it's in your food. So I would just encourage people, like my husband and I spend tons of money on food, but it's totally worth it, and we're so much healthier. And um, so yeah, if it's something, I don't expect everyone to do that, but if it's something that you become passionate about, you just learn more and more. Um, and there's some powerful documentaries on that, but just thank you for the work that you're doing, and for, mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's just so powerful to not just talk about things, but to also um, mm -hmm. gardening and acting mm -hmm. and really learning the way um, of the life so yeah. thank you thank you that's a great comment about labeling gmos and just that mindfulness that we bring every day to the food that we're choosing thinking of the long-term consequences the, the the broader consequences of those choices so that if you can you know pay attention to where your food comes from to pay attention to um, that lack of labeling when that issue if it ever comes up for a vote you know that that to me is a it's a it's a key indicator of the control that companies like Monsanto have over our food system is the fact that we can't even get um, the ingredients labeled on it. We can't even make that choice without those labels. So thank you for your comment. Diane, thank you for coming and speaking. And gentlemen, thank you also. I want to just say a few words about the um, high level of Native American suicide. Mm. Um, in the past few years, I've become a bit of an expert on suicide because um, my son took his life at age 24. Mm. We are not indigenous um, people, but there's a very high rate of suicide everywhere in the United States. And, and as you mentioned, Native American suicide is, is much higher. Um, what I want to say is that um, white people have not suffered the way indigenous people have. And I want to make that clear. What I do want to say is what we have in common is that the lies of the, our white ancestors have affected all of us. Mm -hmm. um, my son um, had just about everything he could want at age 24. And yet, he did not feel like he could fit into the system either. And I'm, again, I'm not even trying to compare with what mm -hmm. indigenous people go through. But I want to say that there is something broken in this system, and it comes from lies. And I appreciate the emphasis on truth-telling in this conference. I appreciate your emphasis. I've read both of your books, and I want to thank you. And I want to say that I'm very committed in every way to work um, for prevention, education, when it comes to suicide and abuse. Mm -hmm. I've started a nonprofit, and I would hope uh, to be able to work in some way to share what our family has gone through with others to try mm -hmm. to stop, um, to pre prevent the despair, um, the, um, the ongoing lies, and, um, and to work for the prevention of abuse. Mm -hmm. Thank you mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you for sharing your story, and, and I, I do want to emphasize that while we have shared truth-telling from our perspective, we're all in this together. You know, all of these issues require all of us working together to make, and, and the, for the purpose of making a better world for our children. You know, this is for our children and our grandchildren that we're here today, so thank you for sharing your story.
Diane, my question relates directly to that. How can we be uh, of support and assistance with the uh, wild health uh, program, with dreaming of a uh, dream of a wild health program? What specifically might we be able to do to uh, support you in your work? Hmm. Thank you. Um, well, if this was a summertime, I'd give you the market schedule. <laughs> um, but we are, we're in our planning fundraising time of year, so um, I guess, you know, supporting, you can support the farm directly during our season by coming to the markets. We have these guys out there working. You know, we train them to uh, work at the market. They earn a stipend to do it. and. And they are the ones really helping educate the community. So supporting us in our markets is a great thing. Um, but also just in doing this work, because then we're helping raise the whole community up. And that to me makes our work easier. It makes all of our lives better. So I thank you for the work that you've done and for everyone in this room for participating in this conference and you know sharing this commitment to these issues. So. But thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Diane. Thank you so much for your work um, with the farming. Um, I think it's very important to get that, to get healthy foods out there and to start getting away from this mass production. Um, I know kind of a statement that I had was that, you know, you see the foods that are cheaper are all unhealthy foods, mm -hmm. um, high in carbs, high in fats, and you spend, it's so much harder for people in poverty to buy healthy foods because they're so much more expensive. I spend over twice the amount I used to on groceries now that I'm eating healthier. Mm -hmm. And so many people can't do that. And I think, you know, the system really needs to change there. And then a quick question I had was, um, where are your markets located? Um, we have, in the summertime, we have one market on uh, Lake Street and 22nd at the, it's the Midtown Farmer's Market. So we're there Tuesday afternoons. And then we do another market in St. Paul at the Elder's Lodge over on the east side. Mm -hmm. My question is for the two young men. Um, and I'm curious about what you've learned um, from being a part of this program that you are going, that you've been able to take into other areas of your life, um, or that you will, you see yourself taking into other areas of your life in the future, either yourself personally or sharing with your peers or your family or your community, either around food or just things that you've learned as far as leadership. Well, we've learned about agricultural techniques and we've learned about such as garden pests and how to deal with them, how to um, be, a sustaining, be a sustaining farmer. Learning, we learned about native plants and like how, well, yeah, like dandelions, well, I learned, for example, or like much higher, like in like, um, like vitamins and all that. And like, I just like really learned much more about plants and, um, learned how to harvest and like actually distinguish each vegetable and um, um, learned kind of types of soil and like different types, like what's the difference between soil and dirt, which is like dirt's on your clothes and soil's in the ground. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that is an example. Um, So every, going out there every day, you just learn new stuff every day. You learn stuff you can't learn in, like, in schools or in classes. Learn about, I don't know, like, learn about our history. Um, learn about, like, nutrition and, uh, like, uh, we normally have, like, groups that come out every week or something, like, I don't know, a couple times a week or guest speakers that come out and educate us about some other some health issue, like we had a teen group come out and talk to us about like teen pregnancy. Um, there's a guest speaker coming out talking about like uh, the like stuff 
that's in pops and juices and stuff like that. We learn, uh, we learn a lot of nutritious stuff. We learn how, like farming, weeding, planting. We've learned about traditional seeds and heirloom seeds. Um, I don't know, you just learn new stuff every day when you're out, like it's new stuff every day. Okay. Yeah. Thank you guys. Um, I also have a question for the young men. Um, I was wondering, well first let's call a thing what it is. It's hard to be a leader. It's hard to stand up and to, to, uh, to have the courage to be who you are and to work for change. And so I was wondering maybe from your perspective, if you could help share some truth with us. How has it been hard for you to be leaders in your own communities, in your own schools, wherever you are? And how is it that we, as we listen and hear, could support you in that? And um, I mean, it's hard enough to be a teenager, you know, but to be a, a leader in general, it's a wilderness land, so if you have any, any truths you'd like to share with us. <laughs> okay, let me think. Um, well, you have a responsibility to take your knowledge and bring it back and give it to other people to teach them what you've learned and to become a better person and become more knowledgeable in these aspects of that culture. And it's just a dream, the, a dream of wild health and help spread that within the community to help improve our health and the awareness of diabetes and the GMOs and um, help each other grow as a, peop as a person and an individual. And um, So um, I guess for me, what's been hard is I have two little brothers and I feel like our little brothers and then I have a little cousin that lives with me and I feel like it's hard for them to relate with like adult males in their lives because I don't know, my family, we don't really have men that stay around too long. It's just um, something that happens and um, like whatever I do, they followed. So whenever I've messed up in life, they've like tried to follow my footsteps and try to be like me. So. Mm. I guess it's been hard trying to like just be perfect in their eyes, like just try to be good all the time and I don't know, like mm, doing good in school or being involved in sports or being helpful around the house or anything like that. And I guess something else that's been hard is being captain of the wrestling team. I have to deal with like a lot of freshmen and sophomores and like a lot of, <laughs> uh, like a lot of still immature kids and they're, they're hard to deal with sometimes, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My name is Renee Gurno. I'm from Red Lake, Minnesota, the center of the known universe. I just want to make a couple of points. First of all, I'd like to say to my two nephews up here, I'm really proud of you for the work that you're doing and for walking your talk and, and standing your ground and being that for our people. The, you have a great future ahead of you in leadership and it's, it's difficult, but what else are you gonna do? <laughs> and an there's another point, there's an excellent film on YouTube um, called Regaining Food Sovereignty. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Um, you must be familiar with that video. Simone Senegals did that, right? Are you from, Diane? Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that video, Regaining Food Sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Okay, comes out of northern Minnesota from the reservations. And, um, and then another quick point to uh, the woman who was sharing about her son and these, uh, the high rates of suicide, the, um, the, Dropout rates, the you know early uh, early deaths. I think the lifespan of a native life expectancy of a native man is 52 years old right now, and for us, we're it's 57 because you know we're women. <laughs> but um, all of the and and the the bad health and all of that. These uh, and now the criminalization of our young. You know the high school to prison pipeline and. Um, 
the U.S. has always made war against Native people by making war against our children. And it's, it's been pretty brutal. It was the uh, boarding schools, then the adoption foster care era, which was when I was young. We lost 60% of our kids to white foster care. <laughs> and then after the Indian Child Welfare Act, I mean, what other group in this world has to have an act of Congress to say that we can raise our own children? And uh, so now it's the criminalization of our young men. Uh, young Native men are the most vulnerable population, 18 to 25 year olds, it's terrifying. We make up around two or three percent of the population in Minnesota, but we make up between 20 and 25 percent of the prison population. So it's just logistically not possible for one half of one percent to do 25 percent of the felonies for the longest period of time. Um, so all of these, my point to all this is that um, all of those so-called socioeconomic indicators of poverty and, you know, or what's wrong with us, uh, they are made to look like they come from within the community and in fact our response is to oppression. So I just wanted to say that and thank you young men. Hi, uh, my name is Arthur, um, and uh, I'd like to thank you also for being here today. Um, I'm trying to formulate a thought here. It's going to come out kind of garbled, but uh, as a uh, descendant of colonialists um, and as we think about truth-telling in our lives and the need for truth-telling in our society in order to have healing um, I'm beginning to come to the um, idea that part of the reason why it can be so difficult to invite people like me into this conversation is because we're so afraid of what we might find out about our own stories. Um, and we're so afraid of um, that we might not find anything good in our history or anything we can be proud of or um, uh, and and I sometimes feel almost as we engage in this work that I feel like a story poacher. I want, I want to take your story. I want to hear the stories of those around me. Um, and, and some of that, is, I think, is, a, is partly avoiding my own story. Um, and so the only thing I can really hang on to in all of this is the concept of interrelatedness. Um, uh, I don't have a, a story that is connected to place, and I really appreciated what you had to say about place, Diane. Um, and, uh, but yet here I am in this place um, with no right to be here if I really dig into the story. Um, and uh, we can't take, th you know, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. <laughs> um, uh, so... Where does that leave us here today? And, and I just, I think I feel like I have to hang on to this concept of interrelatedness. Um, and I'm thinking mostly of Dr. King's writings on that. Um, uh, and so I guess I have a request that I have no right to make, but that you would continue uh, to share your story with us um, as well as in Native communities. Um, and uh, that we continue to share these, these stories together so that um, we can somehow make a new, a new story together because I don't see any other option to that. So, thank you. Hi. My name is Kim, and I was just wondering if you could just give us an idea about um, how how many years this program's been going and 
about how many young people participate like at a, at a time, like each season or whatever, and so like overall over the years, like about how many young people have participated. Um, <coughs> Dream of Wild Health actually started as a program of a nonprofit called Petawakan Tipi, and that began in 1986 as a program providing transitional housing for Native people in recovery. And so that organization was founded by Sally Oje and John Eichhorn. And as part of that process of healing, <clears throat> the clients began asking for a way to reconnect with the land and with traditional foods and medicines. And so it started as just a tiny little garden <clears throat> with some of Sally's grandmother's seeds. And as she, was, as she continued to grow her garden, then um, a Potawatomi elder and seed keeper, Cora Baker, heard about the garden. And she um, had collected seeds all her life. And when she was in her 90s and getting ready to pass, she was really worried about what would happen to them. Excuse me. <coughs> So she gave her collection to the farm. <coughs> and then in um, 2005, we started, we bought a farm in Hugo, that's 10 acres, and we uh, began the youth programs that same year. <coughs> we serve roughly 60 Native students each summer in our direct programs, so the, between the ages of 8 and 18. And so the, the garden warriors that these, these guys are in, <clears throat> it, we have two sessions that are four weeks long, and it's 14 to 15 um, youth in each session. So, and then we do outreach to schools, we have tours come out, we do workshops, uh, and then we do youth leaders throughout the year, <clears throat> and that's usually about 10, 10 youth who participate. So it's been a, it's been a long story in the, in the making. Uh, hi, my name is Mary. Thank you, all three of you. I really appreciate this. I have a question for the gentlemen leaders. Can you tell us a little bit about, in school, um, what has been helpful for you, what, what adults can do to um, reduce the effects of racism and to uh, support you? If you want to give any negative stories, that's okay, too. I think we all need to learn about what we're doing uh, in schools um, to work against you and to help you. Thank you. Um, my school is a multicultural school, IB school, and I don't really like like zone out to like one specific race and like dislike them. I have multiple friends with a uh, different race, like white or ca Caucasian is a better name for it. Uh, like some of the or origin of like Hmong people and um, African Americans and um, Mexican or uh, Latinos. And um, well, what I found is like a better situation where you have a more diverse cultural like school like you can have instead of just having a like more like all Caucasian, all Latino, all African American, all Native American in school and like actually like have like like I don't know like banners that say no racism and like just make sure to like um make sure to emphasize that emphasize that to get along with each other and like I don't know just like it's more in a friendly manner, in a, more of a, hmm, in a positive, back, a positive um, environment with each other. Yeah. Um, so I go to Johnson and it's really, I know it's really a di diverse school. I feel, um, I don't know, maybe a way to reduce racism or stereotypes or discrimination or whatever is, is like the, I don't know, allow, 
kids of like different areas or maybe a different city to go to the school or have like more of that, I guess. So it's not just all kids from like one area or, yeah, I think that'd be a good way to reduce racism or, yeah. At our served at our school and um, we've had the, the privilege of being partnered with uh, we found a partnership with chef Austin Bartold he's the executive chef at the Wade House which he cooks local foods from scratch and teaches and thinks of food as medicine at um, for 150 to 250 people a day so my students have gone and learned how to cook and cooked with him and he has come to our school. And we have a, a local community garden um, that they harvest from and then cook those foods as well as adding other local foods. But it is like a special thing as rather than a regular thing that happens at our school. And we have to overcome even the privilege to use the kitchen um, because he's served serve safe uh, and to allow those students, but to think of food as medicine um, rather than just food as making money, even though that's a piece. I wondered how, if you were able to or wanted to in your schools to find ways to have um, food from scratch, food as medicine served and being part of that process of growing food, marketing food and serving, cooking and serving food. Uh, at my school, there's Future Farmers of America that it's called like stands for FFA and that's like has an agricultural class, like after school club. But I don't attend it because like, like I find like because I'm already in like a Jim Wild Health like organization. But like I, I don't have like time for that because I'm already into that and I'm like and it's the same day as Model UN. So I take that as a club instead because I'm already in an agricultural program that helps me promote like healthy eating. And so, yeah. But my school does have a program that has to deal with that. Um, this is, hi, my name's Leah. Uh, this is a comment for you young leaders. Um, about the struggles of being perfect and tr finding a way to, n to be good all the time, when, especially when you have people who are following you. Something that worked for me was whenever I'd make a mistake, just go and talk to them and be like, this is what happened, this is what went wrong, and this is why you should try and stay away from it. Just going and talk to them and owning up to the mistake, because then they'll look up to you and be like, if he can own up to it or she can own up to it and say, you know what, I was wrong on that, then they can do it too. So that's something that I found has helped me. Well, thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this conversation today. Pidamaya. Thank you. And would you hold just a minute, Diane? 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 <laughs> and young men. <laughs> Thank you for your really very heartwarming uh, and also heartbreaking uh, 
a sharing of, of this history and of the food and the connection of, of race and food. Uh, I, I think of the uh, meaning of this in, in terms of the relationship that you would wish to bring us into by the ways that you have uh, made us more aware uh, of this history and uh, how it has impacted the community and the many and deep losses uh, that you have experienced that we now take on as part of our losses. We thank you and have some gifts of recognition and uh, gifts of gratitude, uh, sharing of sage and sharing of tobacco again. So thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you.